Chapter 2, Part 2 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Amos. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 2 The Vigor of Life. Part 2. The reason why I was alone in the mountains on this occasion was because, for the only time in all my experience, I had a difficulty with my guide. He was a crippled old mountain man with a profound contempt for tender feet, a contempt that in my case was accentuated by the fact that I wore spectacles, which at that day and in that region were usually held to indicate a defective moral character in the wearer. He had never previously acted as a guide, or as he expressed it, trundled a tenderfoot, and though a good hunter who showed me much game, our experience together was not happy. He was very rheumatic, and liked to lie abed late, so that I usually had to get breakfast, and in fact do most of the work around camp. Finally, one day he declined to go out with me, saying that he had a pain. When that afternoon I got back to camp, I speedily found what the pain was. We were traveling very light indeed, I having practically nothing but my buffalo sleeping bag, my wash kit, and a pair of socks. I had also taken a flask of whiskey for emergencies. Although as I found that the emergencies never arose, and that tea was better than whiskey when a man was cold or done out, I abandoned the practice of taking whiskey on hunting trips twenty years ago. When I got back to camp, the old fellow was sitting on a tree trunk, very erect, with his rifle across his knees, and in response to my nod of greeting, he merely leered at me. I leaned my rifle against a tree, walked over to where my bed was lying, and happening to rummage in it for something, I found the whiskey flask was empty. I turned on him at once and accused him of having drunk it, to which he merely responded by asking what I was going to do about it. There did not seem much to do, so I said that we would part company. We were only four or five days from a settlement, and I would go in alone, taking one of the horses. He responded by cocking his rifle and saying that I could go alone and be damned to me, but I could not take any horse. I answered, All right, that if I could not, I could not and began to move around to get some flour and salt pork. He was misled by my quietness and by the fact that I had not in any way resented either his actions or his language during the days we had been together, and did not watch me as closely as he ought to have done. He was sitting with the cocked rifle across his knees, the muzzle to his left. My rifle was leaning against a tree near the cooking things to his right. Managing to get near it, I whipped it up and threw the beat on him, calling, Hands up! He, of course, put up his hands, and then said, Oh, come, I was only joking. To which I answered, Well, I am not. Now straighten your legs and let your rifle go to the ground. He remonstrated, saying the rifle would go off, and I told him to let it go off. However, he straightened his legs in such a fashion that it came to the ground without a jar. I then made him move back and picked up the rifle. By this time he was quite sober, and really did not seem angry, looking at me quizzically. He told me that if I would give him back his rifle, he would call it quits and we could go on together. I did not think it best to trust him, so I told him that our hunt was pretty well through anyway, and that I would go home. There was a blasted pine on the trail, in plain view of the camp, about a mile off, and I told him that I would leave his rifle at that blasted pine if I could see him in camp, but that he must not come after me, for if he did I should assume that it was with hostile intent and would shoot. He said he had no intention of coming after me and as he was very much crippled with rheumatism, I did not believe he would do so. Accordingly, I took the little mare, with nothing but some flour, bacon, and tea, and my bedroll, and started off. At the blasted pine I looked round, and as I could see him in camp, I left his rifle there. I then traveled till dark, and that night, for the only time in my experience, I used in camping a trick of the old-time trappers in the Indian days. I did not believe I would be followed, but still it was not possible to be sure. So after getting supper while my pony fed round, I left the fire burning, repacked the mare, and pushed ahead until it literally became so dark that I could not see. Then I picketed the mare, slept where I was without a fire until the first streak of dawn, and then pushed on for a couple of hours before halting to take breakfast and to let the little mare have a good feed. No plainsman needs to be told that a man should not lie near a fire if there is danger of an enemy creeping up on him, and that above all a man should not put himself in a position where he can be ambushed at dawn. On the second day I lost the trail, and toward nightfall gave up the effort to find it, camped where I was, and went out to shoot a grouse for supper. It was while hunting in vain for a grouse that I came on the bear and killed it as above described. 
When I reached the settlement and went into the store, the storekeeper identified me by remarking, "'You're the tenderfoot that old Hank was trundling, ain't you?' I admitted that I was. A good many years later, after I had been elected vice president, I went on a cougar hunt in northwestern Colorado with Johnny Goff, a famous hunter and mountain man. It was midwinter. I was rather proud of my achievements, and pictured myself as being known to the few settlers in the neighborhood as a successful mountain lion hunter. I could not help grinning when I found out that they did not even allude to me as the vice president-elect, let alone as a hunter, but merely as Johnny Goff's tourist. Of course, during the years when I was most busy at serious work, I could do no hunting, and even my riding was of a decorous kind. But a man whose business is sedentary should get some kind of exercise if he wishes to keep himself in as good physical trim as his brethren who do manual labor. When I worked on a ranch, I needed no form of exercise except my work. But when I worked in an office, the case was different. A couple of summers I played polo with some of my neighbors. I shall always believe we played polo in just the right way for middle-aged men with stables of the general utility order. Of course it was polo which was chiefly of interest to ourselves, the only onlookers being the members of our faithful families. My two ponies were the only occupants of my stable, except a cart horse. My wife and I rode and drove them, and they were used for household errands and for the children, and for two afternoons a week they served me as polo ponies. Polo is a good game, infinitely better for vigorous men than tennis or golf or anything of that kind. There is all the fun of football with the horse thrown in, and if only people would be willing to play it in a simple fashion it would be almost as much within their reach as golf. But at Oyster Bay our great and permanent amusements were rowing and sailing. I do not care for the latter, and am fond of the former. I suppose it sounds archaic, but I cannot help thinking that the people with motorboats miss a great deal. If they would only keep to rowboats or canoes, and use oar or paddle themselves, they would get infinitely more benefit than by having their work done for them by gasoline. But I rarely took exercise merely as exercise. Primarily I took it because I liked it. Play should never be allowed to interfere with work and a life devoted merely to play is, of all forms of existence, the most dismal. But the joy of life is a very good thing, and while work is the essential in it, play also has its place. When obliged to live in cities, I for a long time found that boxing and wrestling enabled me to get a good deal of exercise in condensed and attractive form. I was reluctantly obliged to abandon both as I grew older. I dropped the wrestling earliest. When I became governor, the champion middleweight wrestler of America happened to be in Albany, and I got him to come round three or four afternoons a week. Incidentally, I may mention that his presence caused me a difficulty with a controller, who refused to audit a bill I put in for a wrestling mat, explaining that I could have a billiard table, billiards being recognized as a proper gubernatorial amusement, but that a wrestling mat symbolized something unusual and unheard of and could not be permitted. The middleweight champion was, of course, so much better than I was that he could not only take care of himself, but of me too, and see that I was not hurt, for wrestling is a much more violent amusement than boxing. But after a couple of months he had to go away, and he left as a substitute a good-humored, stalwart professional oarsman. The oarsman turned out to know very little about wrestling. He could not even take care of himself, not to speak of me. By the end of our second afternoon, one of his long ribs had been caved in, and two of my short ribs badly damaged, and my left shoulder blade so nearly shoved out of place that it creaked. He was nearly as pleased as I was when I told him I thought we would vote the war a failure, and abandon wrestling. After that I took up boxing again. While president, I used to box with some of the aides, as well as play single stick with General Wood. After a few years I had to abandon boxing, as well as wrestling. For in one bout a young captain of artillery cross-countered me on the eye, and the blow smashed the little blood vessels. Fortunately it was my left eye, but the sight has been dim ever since, and if it had been the right eye I should have been entirely unable to shoot. Accordingly I thought it better to acknowledge that I had become an elderly man, and would have to stop boxing. I then took up jiu-jitsu for a year or two. When I was in the legislature and was working very hard, with little chance of getting out of doors, all the exercise I got was boxing and wrestling. A young fellow turned up who was a second-rate prize-fighter, the son of one of my old boxing teachers. For several weeks I had him come round to my rooms in the morning to put on the gloves with me for half an hour. Then he suddenly stopped, and some days later I received a letter of woe from him from the jail. 
I found that he was by profession a burglar, and merely followed boxing as the amusement of his lighter moments, or when business was slack. Naturally, being fond of boxing, I grew to know a good many prize fighters, and to most of those I knew I grew genuinely attached. I have never been able to sympathize with the outcry against prize fighters. The only objection I have to the prize ring is the crookedness that has attended its commercial development. Outside of this, I regard boxing, whether professional or amateur, as a first-class sport, and I do not regard it as brutalizing. Of course, matches can be conducted under conditions that make them brutalizing, but this is true of football games and of most other rough and vigorous sports. Most certainly, prize-fighting is not half as brutalizing or demoralizing as many forms of big business, and of the legal work carried on in connection with big business. Powerful, vigorous men of strong animal development must have some way in which their animal spirits can find vent. When I was police commissioner, I found, and Jacob Reese will back me up in this, that the establishment of a boxing club in a tough neighborhood always tended to do away with knifing and gunfighting among the young fellows who would otherwise have been in murderous gangs. Many of these young fellows were not naturally criminals at all, but they had to have some outlet for their activities. In the same way, I have always regarded boxing as a first-class sport to encourage in the Young Men's Christian Association. I do not like to see young Christians with shoulders that slope like a champagne bottle. Of course, boxing should be encouraged in the Army and Navy. I was first drawn to two naval chaplains, Fathers Chadwick and Rainey, by finding that each of them had brought half a dozen sets of boxing gloves and encouraged their crews in boxing. When I was police commissioner, I heartily approved the effort to get boxing clubs started in New York on a clean basis. Later I was reluctantly obliged to come to the conclusion that the prize ring had become hopelessly debased and demoralized, and as governor I aided in the passage of and signed the bill putting a stop to professional boxing for money. This was because some of the prize fighters themselves were crooked, while the crowd of hangers-on who attended and made up and profited by the matches had placed the whole business on a basis of commercialism and brutality that was intolerable. I shall always maintain that boxing contests themselves make good, healthy sport. It is idle to compare them with bullfighting. The torture and death of the wretched horses in bullfighting is enough of itself to blast the sport, no matter how great the skill and prowess shown by the bullfighters. Any sport in which the death and torture of animals is made to furnish pleasure to the spectators is debasing. There should always be the opportunity provided in a glove fight or bare fist fight to stop it when one competitor is hopelessly outclassed or too badly hammered. But the men who take part in these fights are hard as nails, and it is not worth while to feel sentimental about their receiving punishment, which as a matter of fact they do not mind. Of course the men who look on ought to be able to stand up with the gloves or without them themselves. I have scant use for the type of sportsmanship which consists merely in looking on at the feats of someone else. Some as good citizens as I know are or were prize fighters. Take Mike Donovan of New York. He and his family represent a type of American citizenship of which we have a right to be proud. Mike is a devoted temperance man and can be relied upon for every moment in the interest of good citizenship. I was first immediately thrown with him when I was police commissioner. One evening he and I, both in dress suits, attended a temperance meeting of Catholic societies. It culminated in a lively set-to between myself and a Tammany senator who was a very good fellow, but whose ideas of temperance differed radically from mine, and as the event proved, from those of the majority of the meeting. Mike evidently regarded himself as my backer. He was sitting on the platform beside me, and I think felt as pleased and interested as if the set-to had been physical instead of merely verbal. Afterward I grew to know him well, both while I was governor and while I was president, and many a time he came on and boxed with me. Battling Nelson was another staunch friend, and he and I think alike on most questions of political and industrial life, although he once expressed to me some commiseration, because as president I did not get anything like the money returned for my services that he aggregated during the same term of years in the ring. Bob Fitzsimmons was another good friend of mine. He has never forgotten his early skill as a blacksmith, and among the things that I value and always keep in use is a penholder made by Bob out of a horseshoe, with an inscription saying that it is made for and presented to President Theodore Roosevelt by his friend and admirer, Robert Fitzsimmons. I have for a long time had the friendship of John L. Sullivan, than whom in his prime no better man ever stepped into the ring. He is now a Massachusetts farmer. John used occasionally to visit me at the White House, his advent always causing a distinct flutter among the waiting senators and congressmen. 
When I went to Africa, he presented me with a gold-mounted rabbit's foot for luck. I carried it through my African trip, and I certainly had good luck. On one occasion, one of my prize-fighting friends called on me at the White House on business. He explained that he wished to see me alone, sat down opposite me, and put a very expensive cigar on the desk, saying, Have a cigar. I thanked him and said I did not smoke, to which he responded, Put it in your pocket. He then added, Take another. Put both in your pocket. This I accordingly did. Having thus shown at the outset the necessary formal courtesy, my visitor, an old and valued friend, proceeded to explain that a nephew of his had enlisted in the Marine Corps, but had been absent without leave, and was threatened with dishonorable discharge on the ground of desertion. My visitor, a good citizen and patriotic American, was stung to the quick at the thought of such an incident occurring in his family, and he explained to me that it must not occur, that there must not be the disgrace to the family, although he would be delighted to have the offender handled rough, to teach him a needed lesson. He added that he wished I would take him and handle him myself, for he knew that I would see that he got all that was coming to him. Then a look of pathos came into his eyes, and he explained, That boy I just cannot understand. He was my sister's favorite son, and I always took a special interest in him myself. I did my best to bring him up the way he ought to go. But there was just nothing to be done with him. His tastes were naturally low. He took to music. What form this debasing taste for music assumed I did not inquire, and I was able to grant my friend's wish. End of Chapter 2, Part 2 Recording by Chris Amos www.chrisamos.net